This is the story of my pilgrimage to Hilda's Abbey in Whitby. I drove along the A171, hurtling towards Whitby with great anticipation. I'd received brief directions how to reach Hilda's Abbey from the Holy Island community. It turns out I'm merely the latest in a long line of people stretching out over 1300 years to make this same pilgrimage from Holy Island to Whitby. I didn't have worried. From well over two miles away, I caught my first glimpse of the magnificent abbey. It was sat proudly on a cliff top, etched boldly against a cloudless skyline. I felt my pulse race as I followed its unfolding outline. The weather was glorious. Did someone know I was coming? And as I step out the car, I'm met by a noisy welcoming committee of seagulls swooping overhead. And I guess Hilda would have taken them as a welcome sign that she was back home from her own latest pilgrimage. The gusting wind takes my breath away, and it's surprisingly bracing, and yet I find it invigorating, dare I say spiritually uplifting. And as I rush through the ticket booth and pick my way towards the abbey, as I approach the pilgrimage, it takes on a photographic perspective. The approach to the abbey is beautiful, and my camera strains to capture both the awesome and the ethereal quality of the abbey. The lake at its entrance adds to its earthly connection with the surrounding beautiful grounds. And as I get closer, the sea and the Whitby coastline come into view. They are, however, somewhat obscured by buildings from a later age. My instinct tells me that the coastline sightline would have been cleaner and much more magnificent in Hilda's time. And as I wander into the Abbey ruins trying to take it all in, I manage to locate a guide who tells me that Hilda's original abbey was located on this site. Subsequent generations have built over the site, but no doubt they felt the same sense of connection with past spiritual glories. The choir of the abbey still makes a proud statement. In the autumnal sunlight, the different colours and warmth of the bricks give it a certain richness and unusual quality. The visiting children seem to connect with the place as an intangible level and they provide an exuberant presence. A toddler runs laughing round one of the pillars, and another yells in delight as she wobbles up the ramp towards the choir. A young lad takes five minutes to sit on one of the remaining pillar stumps. Deep in thought, his iPod buds no longer seem required. These children simply feel at home, and I sense Hilda's gentle smile and appreciation of their playful companionship. I walk out of the rear of the abbey, and somehow something just doesn't feel right. The walls round the abbey hinder the sea view, and St Mary's Church seems to have leapt in front of the abbey to claim its prime position. I feel that in Hilda's days these brick barriers would not have been in place. So with added conviction I make my way swiftly into St Mary's graveyard to claim my first unhindered view of the sea. And as I drink in the magnificent view, the sea breeze caresses me and I feel the hairs rise on the back of my neck. I sense Hilda was here. Perhaps even on the night before her famous synod at Whitby in 60, 664. Yes, I'm sure of it. On the night before this momentous synod, I sense she would have been out walking on this very cliff top, seeking to calm her troubled spirit in prayer. And as she laid her troubles before God, I have a feeling that the loving response she received was, Simply love me with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul, Hilda. And love your neighbours yourself. The rest is simply background noise. Trust in me. What will be, will be. But I reflect it still must have been painful for Hilda when the Synod ruled in favour of Roman regulations instead of her beloved Celtic ones. And her heart must have been absolutely shredded when Coleman, Aidan's successor, decided to leave Holy Island for Ireland. How must, she miss, how must she have felt as she watched him leave, a remaining strand of her friend Aidan, leaving England's shores? This vast, rambling area by the cliffs must have proved inspirational for Hilda, as they do for me now, and I get drawn towards the cliff edge again, almost as if I'm being beckoned into some sort of spiritual presence. Is this what Hilda felt? The sheer ruggedness of this cliff hinterland and the symphony of crashing waves below seamlessly blend nature with God's omnipresence. 
and I can imagine that Hilda's original abbey stood proudly astride the town below, enveloping it with a timeless love and sense of peace. Many leaders and rulers were drawn here to Whitby and sought Hilda's advice. God's wind in this area seems to have brought her very wise counsel. As I wander back to the abbey, I watch a mother hold up her young daughter so she can get a better view of the enormity of this place. A place which feels steeped in prayer. It's certainly a very spiritually thin and happy place. On my way out, I meet a young family just arriving. I pause enough to take their photo and they return the favour. The wife tells me how she feels drawn to the abbey and expresses an interest in visiting Holy Island. I encourage her pilgrimage and take heart in this developing connection with her innate spirituality. I find myself exiting the abbey grounds with a heavy heart. I realise for the first time that Hilda's Abbey is not an easy place to leave. Pilgrims of all ages seem to have an easy connection with the place. Perhaps they are not always aware why, but the connection for me is undeniable. And as my car pulls away, I feel its hidden pull like an unseen gravity force field. Yes, I quietly whisper to Hilda. I promise I'll be back, and next time I'll linger with you for longer. I sense Hilda smiles, turns, and strides out back towards her beloved cliff top, eager to resume her eternal communion with her beloved God. She is at peace, and she is at home. And I sense that without a doubt, my pilgrimage has provided me with inspiration, with a sense of vision, and I return with enthusiasm and passion.